So what do DNA results give you? They give you a list of matches and um, those matches are basically your cousins and you will share a common ancestor. And the amount of DNA you share with each match, um, oh. <coughs> excuse me, for example, will be measured in centimorgan segments, length, percent, and um, in the case of mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA, the other is ethnicity. So a lot of people will take a DNA test because they want to know what their ethnic makeup is, which is not always exact and not always as accurate or maybe doesn't match the tree that you thought it did. So it can be helpful in some cases and maybe not helpful in other cases. Um, hopefully your list of matches will also have trees um, of their family trees. If they know them, they might be documented, undocumented, or they might not have any tree at all, but they can all give you clues. Um, because you're searching for what you have in common in those trees. You can also um, use those even if they don't have a tree. Um, they have what's called uh, matches of your matches or in common with. Um, and I use those a lot because maybe they don't know who they are. But if you match them and somebody else, that other person might know who they are. And so then I can use their tree to help um, give me some clues. So I would give you, I'm gonna start out with the Y DNA examples. Um, and I admit that some of these are a little bit more, well, actually these are all a lot more complex than I'm gonna present. And I didn't have time to put it together to the degree, but I did want to give an example of each of these um, types of tests and how I have been using or are using them. This is one of my personal um, uh, projects that I began working on a number of years ago, probably maybe even eight years ago, I became interested in um, my my mom's father's mother's line, which was, goes back to uh, George Cornwell. And uh, he was born in 1777, died in 1846. And uh, just go to this, a book was written by one of the great, great granddaughters named Faye Cornwall Bolin. And um, she wrote a book about Joseph Cornwall and um, his ancestors. She had done extensive research. I think this was back in the 70s. And she interviewed everybody that she could, and she couldn't find enough um, information per se to really pin it down. Um, she had a lot of documentation, it was great, but as you know, in Ireland, a lot of uh, records are not available. And so it was hard to, to say for certainty that some of her theories were correct. Um, so I poked around, um, there were three common surnames, Cornwall, Corner, Cordner. I even had letters from a genealogist back in the 70s to um, one of the relatives that said, you know, it seems like there could be a connection, but not sure how to make, you know, determine that. There just wasn't enough information. So um, last Christmas, about that time, I had a descendant from the Cordner line who also originated in that same place in Ireland. Um, contacted me because I had been working on that, trying to determine, are these the same families? And when she uh, reached out, I discovered that she was a direct coordinator uh, descendant. And I said, you know, we could solve this mystery. If you could find um, a direct male heir on the coordinator line, I will find a direct male heir on the Cornwall line and we'll take Y DNA test and we can prove or disprove the theory that these families are related with just these two tests. And so that's what she did. I went and knocked on um, and uh, found, found a cousin uh, that was a direct male Cornwall heir and asked him if he would be willing to take a, D, a Y DNA test. He had taken an autosomal, so I thought that he would probably be okay to take the Y DNA test. And, and he was great and he did, and he's been very helpful. And this other person took and went to her grandfather who was living, who was a direct coordinator heir, and he tested, um, it took the Y DNA test. And um, that was kind of an eye opener for us because when I got ours back, it actually pointed to the surname of Kerno. And you can see here at Family Tree DNA, um, the matches, were all Kernow matches. And um, there was no Cornwall or Cordner or anything. And even better for me, they actually had really strong paper trails um, going back to um, these Kernows who were in Tonac, Cornwall. And um, with very little distance, which means that there were uh, very slight differences in the DNA 
um, out of all of these different markers, which puts them pretty darn close. So that is still, I'm still working on that, but and now I'm focused on descent and Nancy research to find out how did the kernels actually turn into the Cornwalls um, and get from Cornwall to Ireland and, and what time period, when was that change taking place? But I'm within a couple of generations where um, had we not done the Y DNA test, I never would have even considered that as a surname or known to look for it. And since then, I've also had other cousins um, reach out and have shared their DNA so that I can get more of those pieces and more of their matches to really um, uh, tighten this in. The next thing after I discovered this then, um, and actually, so here it was, is we had this mystery was actually solved that Cornwall was actually Kerno. And when the coroner results came back, it said that, well, they possibly be, could be coroners, but they were definitely not related through the Cornwall Kerno line. They were a completely different Happel group. And so there was no connection to those families. So to me, that was a big win that could never really been solved um, through without the use of Y-DNA to help make that distinction between the two families. So I'm sure they will be happy that I'll leave their family alone and not play with their um, family and, and I'll stick with mine. I don't know. No, it's, it's actually really kind of fun to collaborate. And um, this was really a, a fun thing to be able to discover after all this time. Um, so after I found the Kerno surname, then what I did is I went over to Ancestry and I typed in the surname Kerno just to see, well, do I have any matches? Um, I should say, um, not only did I have this cousin, but before um, my grand uncle passed away, I um, went and literally less than a month, probably like three weeks before he passed away, I uh, was able to obtain his DNA and I tested him for everything. I did autosomal mitochondrial um, uh, uh, Y DNA because I knew once he was gone, I was going to lose a whole generation of DNA that would get me closer back. And so I'm really grateful that I did that. But what I did is I took... Um, Kerno, and I started searching to see, well, is there any validity to that? Do we have any matches? And I've done this not only on the person who took the Y DNA test, I've taken it on my grand uncle um, and the other people who have reached out who have shared their DNA with me. I've also done that. And so I've, I've been gathering all these um, ancestors with this Kerno surname. And um, I am within a, a generation or two. I, I have it pretty narrowed down, except that I found out that a lot of those Families lived in a small area for many generations and intermarried, so it's a little bit more complex than I thought it would be, but um, but it's closer and there's no way we would have gotten to this um, place had we not taken the DNA test that we did. So um, this is my ongoing project and I'm really excited about um, where it's going and what we're learning. So um, another study, this is um, for a client that I'm working with and she gave me permission to use hers. Um, and this is a case study in mitochondrial DNA. Um, the, the question that really came about was um, this woman named Elizabeth Cooper, who was the wife of Benjamin F. Collins and is this um, woman's great, great, great grandmother. And nobody has been able to figure out where she came from. She it's like, she just, dis she just appeared. And um, the records back in the South in that time were just pretty sketchy. And so um, this is Elizabeth Cooper Collins and she was born the 20th of October in 1817 in either Mississippi or Alabama, I even think maybe Tennessee, there's a lot of um, maybes. And the family legend believed that Elizabeth was the daughter of the French pirate Jean Lafitte, which automatically intrigued me because I wanna know and nobody's been able to solve this or figure it out. But there are probably some people who say, yes, she is. She looks just like him. And there's other people who say, no, it definitely isn't. Um, and uh, anyway, Elizabeth died on the 15th of November in 1908. And uh, no death records, no birth records. Uh, nothing has been able to conclusively identify who her parents were. So in fact, here you can see that picture was posted in Ancestry. It says the um, oral history says she was the daughter of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Um, and, you know, they thank whoever gave the photo. And then you can see that it, this uh, pit portrait had been saved by 10 of 45 people. But there's a comment below uh, two years ago that says she is not the daughter of pirate Jean Lafitte. So, so I, that was the first thing I wanted to dispel. I wanted to see, is that true? Um, but she's a female, and so there's no way to use Y-DNA to solve that mystery. Um, 
we took DNA tests. So the the um, client she was uh, she had tested at 23andMe and Ancestry.com. She transferred her uh, DNA to Family Tree DNA, GEDmatch, and MyHeritage. And then um, for the mitochondrial DNA, 23andMe will actually give you that as a haplogroup U2E2. Um, but recently I said, if we're gonna find the father, we actually really have to determine who the mother is as well. Um, and probably first because, uh, because there's so much conflicting information. And so we did the full mitochondrial haplogroup at Family Tree DNA, which gave us even a little bit more um, specific information of U2E2A1C, which is her haplogroup. And so given that we had that information, um, we were able to determine that uh, she descends from this couple, um, Jeremiah Sperling and Drusilla Baldwin. And what I've done is I had to take uh, what commonly came up um, with matches, uh, a, a common couple, and then I started going back up Jeremiah's line to see if there were any descendants that matched from Jer Jeremiah's family, and then also Drusilla's. Now Drusilla's is actually much more difficult, but she is the, the um, mitochondrial match. And the fact that we have lots of matches from Jeremiah's family makes it most likely that they are um, the common ancestor. And that's 1760. So that's not really um, much earlier than uh, Elizabeth Cooper was born. So this is an ongoing thing. We're zeroing in, we're getting really close. But as, as my client said, she never had even heard those names before, had never, would never have even looked for those had we not had the mitochondrial DNA to um, give us those clues to point us in an, another direction. So I'm really excited about this project. And um, in fact, her family tree DNA um, uh, haplogroup, which further defined it just barely, literally came back this last week. So there's still much to do there. Um, so there, we also did check into the Cooper surname. We uh, checked for matches in autosomal, and we did find that numerous cousin matches for descendants of the Cooper surname make it more likely that Elizabeth's father was a Cooper and not Jean Lafitte. Now, there is still the open possibility that the mother was the Cooper, um, but, um, and, and the crazy thing about this is that she does have a cousin who literally is related to Jean Lafitte, but it does not appear to be um, related to Elizabeth. So, so it's still a, a very fun puzzle that we're working on, but, um, and we're zeroing in on the Coopers. Again, most of the time period that we're looking for, we don't have a lot of records to substantiate the information. And so that's what makes it complicated um, uh, because we're, we're having to follow other family lines, um, try to find as much documentation as possible, but the DNA, um, helps to focus in and tell us what can be correct and what is likely not correct. So this um, autosomal DNA case study is one, one of the very first cases that I worked on. I was newly volunteering at the Family History Center. I was just starting to get into DNA and a friend asked if I would help her sister-in-law who had been doing research on her great-great-great-grandfather's um, line for many, many years, um, in fact, 10 solid years, and I agreed to meet with her, and she came in carrying binder after binder of, of research. She had done extensive research. Um, so basically, the question is, who was the mother of Oscar Stewart, which was her great-great-great-grandfather, and, um, and also um, the first wife of James Stewart, who was Oscar's father. And so we started by going through all the information that she had researched, looking at that, and we kind of stripped it back to maybe there were some assumptions made on family search. Somebody had put in a father that they thought that was clearly didn't really add up to either of us, and there was no documentation for any of it. So we decided we would start back with the basics, put in the information that we did know, and then we would... Um, supplement with the DNA to either uh, confirm or dispute some of the information that was found. Um, this is a letter or um, I'm not sure what they call it. Um, I th it was a transcribed notes basically from uh, Mary Louisa Stewart Gunn who was a granddaughter and um, of Oscar Stewart and 
it looked to me that she had written down notes of what she could remember. Now, if you zoom in, you can see it says Oscar Stewart, his mother's sister's maiden name is Hastings, Elsie, Nancy, and Janet. So not clearly written for sure, um, his mother's sister's maiden name. So was it um, a mistake in how it was transcribed? Was it really the sister's maiden name and maybe there was a half relationship? Or, um, or was his mother's actual maiden name, Miss Hastings and sisters really uh, referred to Elsie, Nancy, and Janet? And it had also said that Oscar was younger than the girls and that he had been born in Ohio on September 20th, 1832. So, so what we could glean from this is Oscar's mother's maiden name probably was Hastings, but we wanted to find some verification of that. And family members had called her Anne um, from other records, but nobody could prove that. And there were no records to state that. And then Oscar had three older sisters, Elsie, Nancy, and Janet, that had somehow become lost um, after um, uh, the father remarried. So let's look at the father, James Stewart. He was from Massachusetts, which we knew from rec uh, census records, which oddly enough, um, Massachusetts has great records, birth records, and family records, but James was nowhere to be found in those Massachusetts records. Um, James lived and died in Berrien, Michigan. We knew from his obituary. His first wife was maybe Anne Hastings, they, and who either died or divorced because he married Abigail Olin in Indiana in 1844. And we know that because of the marriage record. And then Oscar stayed um, with his father after um, he remarried. And so that's kind of the basic um, outline of James Stewart. So we did the DNA testing. Um, uh, the, the, the great great granddaughter who I was helping her name Susan, her father was Roy Vernon and um, was Oscar's great grandson. He took an autosomal DNA test at ancestry.com. Um, he was not a candidate for Y DNA because it didn't go straight up his father's line or mitochondrial DNA in this case because it didn't go straight up. Um, the questions we were trying to answer did not go up his mother's line. Um, we also took his autosomal DNA and uploaded the family tree DNA, GEDmatch, and MyHeritage.com. I will admit, because I was somewhat new at the time, um, I would have encouraged him to also test at 23andMe um, to get more pieces of information. But um, he was quite elderly, and I think he, I believe he passed not too long um, after um, we had, maybe within the year of the, that we did the testing. So while we were waiting for the DNA test to come back and looking at all the research that had been done, um, we were looking for Elsie, Nancy, and Janet. What happened to them? Where did they go? Why did they go? And um, so it, it had just been really difficult. Um, Susan had done great research and then probably actually found at least one or two of the girls, but had not enough information to prove that it was them. And so we um, used the DNA matches which then provided clues and then confirmed the correct daughters in their families. So um, it, it was a combination of uh, finding records and then using the DNA, does this make sense? Is, could this be correct? Do we have people who match? Um, can we find these surnames? Um, and I'll apologize, this, this case was actually way more complicated as I started to put it in. I, I know I actually left out some good details, um, but I certainly could not have put the majority of the details in because uh, it was it was such a complicated family. Um, what we know is that Nancy Colby Stewart Summers, as, as she turned out to be, she was born in 1835, Wellington, Lorraine, Iowa, Ohio. So that put the family in Ohio. Um, her death certificate listed her mother as not known, but the birthplace as New York. So that gave us another piece of information. We knew that there was some New York connection. Um, find a grave lists Nancy as Nancy Stewart Summers. And in 1850 census, um, there was a Nancy who was 15 years old living with a Frederick and Clarissa Sharp, which later we found out her, um, Clarissa's maiden name was Olin. And you'll recall that James' second wife, um, last name or maiden name was Olin as well. So we thought maybe there was some sort of family connection. And I, I forgot to double check on it, but I think Clarissa might have been the sister. So, so now we're starting to put these pieces together and they're starting to make sense. And you can see there were different spellings of Stuart. 
Um, I also uh, neglected to put in there, there was an obituary that for some reason I couldn't lay my hand on that said that she had been deprived of her mother at three months old, I believe. And so that actually, um, now you could say, well, she was deprived because her mother died or she was deprived because her mother left. We really still don't know what happened to um, her mother. But another good clue was that um, after she married George, she had a daughter named Elsie. And you'll recall her, she had a sister named Elsie um, and that wasn't necessarily the most common name that we came across in these families. So that was a very helpful clue. So we begin with surname searches in almost all cases when we're trying to prove something. Um, the family believed that Hastings was the mother's maiden name. And we knew that the father's name was Stuart for sure. Um, so we started doing searches on Stuart, different variations of spelling for Stuart, and also on Hastings. And what we did is we found several families that had not only Stuarts, but also Hastings in their lines. And there was one couple that came up that was very interesting, Gara and Charlotte Hastings. And they were really a, a big key to our research. Gara and Charlotte Hastings were found in the 1850 census for Hillsdale, Michigan. Um, and it listed Gara and Charlotte Hastings with Elsa Stewart. Now, notice again, a different spelling of Elsie um, Elsa and also Stewart. It was Stewart rather than Stewart. So, and um, it said that she had been born about 1830 in New York. Uh, later, we discovered that Charlotte's maiden name was Stewart. So that was a really significant clue. And we would not have come across or known um, about Garrett and Charlotte Hastings, not only because Elsa's name was spelled a little bit differently, um, and we didn't know that she'd been born in New York. Um, we didn't know to look in Michigan until we came across a number of matches showing Garrett and Charlotte Hastings as the, the um, uh, um, a, a couple that could be related. So if we look at Elsie Stewart Routson, who she, who she ended up being, she was born 29th of August, 1829 in Genesee, New York. And remember in that 1850 census, she's living with Gara Hastings and Charlotte Stewart Hastings. So we're starting to put some connections together. Well, she grew up and married um, Andrew Jackson Routson. And he happened to be the son of John Henry Routson and Sarah Franks. Well, that was really interesting. And this, this brings the principle of what they call um, uh, friends, associates, neighbors, and doing the research for all of their extended family. I generally will research down and then go back up the spouse's families because that's where you can start to really build some connections. Well, that Sarah Franks, that Franks surname, um, we kept coming up with matches that showed this Franks surname. We didn't know how much value to put on it, but it was um, the DNA matches um, listing Franks as a surname multiple times that we kept bumping into that led us to find an 1844 marriage record for Jeanette Stewart and Moses W. Franks in Ohio. So Janet was actually Jeanette. So things are really coming together and this was um, just, uh, everything just felt like it was coming together between uh, using the traditional research, things that Susan had already found but couldn't confirm, and then using the DNA, we were starting to put these pieces um, together to, to build some sort of family um, connections. Now, I have to admit, and I, I wanted to go back and find a picture and put it in here because I asked Susan to diagram out all these families that we were putting together in their connections. And literally, um, they were poster sized sheets, and we found out these families were very much interconnected. Um, which not only made the DNA a little bit more complicated to prove, but, um, but we found um, pretty tight-knit um, relationships. We actually, even through DNA, were able to, to identify where um, uh, an application for the Sons, uh, I think it was the, the American, Sons of the American Revolution, where they had actually had incorrect information and it kept getting copied and copied, but through DNA, we were able to prove that that um, link was incorrect and we've corrected it in our tree. So this is a chart that I used to use um, a program called Scapel. And so this is where I laid out a lot of the DNA matches that we found. It's certainly not all of them, but they were critical ones because um, I, in 1820, we had found some Hastings and Stewart's living in Genesee, um, New York in a town called Pembroke. And that was really key. If you look around, you can see that there are, um, 
red boxes around several names. And all of those families had lived in Pembroke, Genesee, New York. So we wanted to explore a little bit more. And you'll see right here in the middle, um, here's Gara and Charlotte Hastings. And if in fact they were a close family member, like we were beginning to suspect, um, that Nancy Hastings um, is who we believe, started to believe the mother was, and I know that this is not as logical as I would have liked it to have been in my explanation, but we finally um, determined that there was a Jonathan Hastings who had married Dolly Taylor and had a daughter named Nancy Ann Hastings born about the time that we were looking for. And if she was the mother of Nancy, which we later found was Nancy Colby Stewart, um, that would make sense that um, that uh, Gara Hastings was a half sibling to Nancy um, through a, a, a different wife, and that it would have made sense that Nancy could have gone and lived with an aunt and uncle. Now that still didn't prove it. Um, one other thing that we found was interesting is Nancy, and we had discovered through um, her death records, I believe, or some records that her middle name was Colby, which seemed kind of unique and unusual given the time um, or the other names. We just didn't come across that name. So I, it just really stood out to me that there was some connection. And sure enough, as we started putting this together, we believed that Charlotte Stewart was actually the sister of James Stewart. And um, Charlotte's sister, Nancy, so oldest sister, Nancy, who Nancy could have been named after, um, was married to Abner Colby. So all of these pieces just started fitting into place. And then, um, as you can see, we had DNA descendants from each one of these families that were in um, appropriate amounts for the relationship. Um, some maybe a little bit more because these families had intermarried. So we took that into account. Uh, but, but it was just really um, great to see this and to confirm um, these relationships that they were adding up and making sense especially in the context. Now, um, since that time, Ancestry came out with uh, a new tool called Through Lines, which um, would have been so great back then. But um, in this case, you can see here's James Stewart, who is the father of Oscar. And um, we put in Nancy Colby Stewart as a sibling. Um, we found Betsy. Um, we also had the half siblings as Ashman and Edgar. And you can see that they had descendants coming down that matched in the appropriate amounts. Um, so all of a sudden that, that supports and substantiates that James Stewart was the father of all of them and that we've got the right um, uh, family links. You can see this Nancy, she had Annabelle Summers and then her son uh, was George Summers Earl, which I'm, um, you know, by marriage. So it just was adding up. Now, remember we, we made the assumption, we said, well, we think that Jonathan Hastings is Oscar's grandfather and that Nancy, because he had a daughter, Nancy Ann Hastings, and um, that she was possibly the mother of um, Oscar. So then we're now looking to see, well, do we share DNA with Jonathan's other um, children coming down through them? And sure enough, as you come down through each of those lines that all of the children share DNA in the appropriate amounts. And I didn't um, bring these other ones down, but David had five matches below him. Sylvia had three matches. So as time goes on and more people test through the use of through lines, um, the computer is actually figuring it out and saying, hey, we also believe these are two, you may want to check them out. And so the last thing that we would want to do, and we haven't done yet, is to go through and do a, a proper Y and mitochondrial study by taking, um, uh, if we can, uh, Nancy's mother and finding any daughters that came through, perhaps through Sylvia, and then um, determining uh, do we have the correct mother based on, so those mitochondrial uh, matches should be identical. And then also um, going through uh, Jane, James Stewart, that his father is who he is by uh, correcting that. And this this um, presentation alone would be a full <laughs> two hours to, to go through all the information that we found and all the support that we have. But I would still say that it's not um, completely finished until we take and do those last white in mitochondrial DNA to verify the information. 
And um, I used to use these icons that I would put in Ancestor if I had at least three separate descendants from three separate children from an ancestor. And so um, Oscar, when we started, um, all we knew is his father's name was James and we did not know who his mother's were, mother was. But now you can see that we have um, basically descendants from every one of those ancestors um, in multiples. And so we're quite confident that we have found the correct parents. And, um, and so I'm really excited about that. To come to some of the fun stuff that happens, this was a, a little bit of a surprise. Um, I received a message through Family Search in April that said, as a consequence of a DNA swab, my elder son, I have just figured out what became of my grandfather, Joel Freeman Avant. Um, and this was from um, a cousin named Ken Roberts. And I was familiar with the family uh, because I had actually uploaded photographs. I hadn't spent a lot of time on it, but I had uploaded this photograph probably back in 2015 or 2014. And here you can see I've highlighted my husband's grandparents who are in the photograph. And, and I just, I haven't spent a lot of time on that because I'm helping other people do their lines and I've got some, um, and I'm kind of going back and out forward. But um, you can see this little couple here, this mother and the daughter. Well, this little girl in the picture is Ken's mother and the woman next to him is Ken's grandmother. And this grandmother um, is Emma Leolin Clements. And she was actually present at the birth of um, of my husband's grandfather. And when uh, the little girl was just uh, less than a year, her father, Joel Freeman Avant, disappeared, never to be seen again in their lifetime. So this was back in the 1920, 21, um, in that, sometime in that year, um, Joel just disappears and nobody knows what's happened to him. They go on, um, she never remarries. Um, the daughter goes on, gets married and has children and one of those is Kenneth. And so Ken uh, reaches out to me, sends me that message and now we have a history for him. I didn't have time to put all the detail, but um, he moved to El Paso, Texas around 1920 to 21, which we oddly enough had found newspaper clippings. We had found um, city directories. Um, I became very interested in this because I'm like, well, how do you know for sure that's who it is? Um, but what we know is that he changed his name to Owen Jonathan Carson. He married in 1926. He fathered two sons. And then um, I forgot to put the death date in there. Um, apologies. But this photograph that we have comes from one of those two sons' um, children who also took a DNA test. And um, this was a uh, picture was taken. Now, one of the things you'll notice in this picture is he actually has an artificial leg. And so when um, when I was first reached out, or when Kenneth first reached out to me, I, I was like intrigued because I had never done somebody who just disappeared. I, I wanted to know more. And so I did a little bit of my own research. We have a lot of the records. We have a lot of the pictures. I just, but nobody ever knew what happened to him. So we didn't have that piece. And so I found a record um, for his uh, draft registration. And in the draft registration, it said that he had a missing um, leg an, or an artificial leg. So I wrote back to Ken and I said, well, you know, if your John Owen Jonathan Carson has a, an artificial leg, then we'll know that's him. And sure enough, he sends the back this photograph with um, the missing leg. And uh, so that was just really exciting. We went on to do more research um, and were able to determine that some of his family members actually live not very far away from him, which makes me think that it's possible that his um, family did, maybe his side of the family knew where he was. We just don't know for a fact, can't find the proof, but oddly enough, they ended up living in the same town, not too far away. So um, that's still one of my favorite little intriguing stories that um, it wasn't something we were looking for. I had no knowledge of, but had certainly, um, the reason uh, Kenneth reached out to me is because I had uploaded all those photographs. And so it's been really great to be a part of it. And he is now one of my favorite pen pals. Um, he writes just fun stories and um, anecdotes and anytime he finds something new and I was able to find some information that actually he hadn't been able to find and so we've been um, collaborating on this and it's just kind of a, a fun interesting story um, to know 110 years later 
what actually happened to um, his, or a hundred years later, what happened to his grandfather that he never met or knew. So that is um, pretty much the end of those stories. But I just, at the end of the day, you have to think, what is your goal? You know, start with what do you know, um, then determine, you know, if or what DNA tests can help you know more. And then you, you do have to do the research, you have to do the due diligence and, um, and put those pieces together using them um, together. Um, one of the things I forgot to, to say is that in the end, we literally never found any record for James Stewart other than um, the few um, with his family. After that time, we have not found a marriage record. Obviously, we have not found a birth record. We have nothing except for um, the circumstantial evidence and DNA evidence to tie him to the family, but but I am confident that we have the right one. I believe that the reason he wasn't in the Massachusetts records was because the family had moved to uh, uh, New York right about that time period, which is why he ended up meeting Aunt Nancy Ann Hastings there and marrying. And because um, birth records and marriage records weren't necessarily required at that time, um, and no Bible records or anything has been found. Um, but we, again, the DNA evidence supported, and we had records that there was a Nancy Ann Hastings, who was the daughter of um, her parents, and she is the right age. So we believe that we have found her, but again, not a single record other than these few um, antidotal things and a whole lot of DNA have supported that. So th those um, mysteries um, could never have been solved without DNA. And so I'm really grateful for uh, the opportunity to have been able to learn. Again, it's a line upon line um, experience and takes a lot of time, but it's certainly rewarding um, if you're willing to put in the time to do that. And, um, and it also saves a lot of time um, because you, you actually can direct your research.